Um, we've heard some um, discussion this morning about demand, demand for broadband, demand for services. Um, this is, I suppose, really brings the whole equation together and brings it all home. What exactly are consumers expecting? The way I often express it myself is that consumers, they're looking for services, they're looking for an experience, they're looking for communication. They're not actually looking for technology. Most consumers I know couldn't care whether the broadband comes out of a water tap or out of the, out of the wall or out of a windmill or some way through the air. Once the service is delivered to them, to their house, to their family, and they can communicate with their friends, get the content that they want. And for an operator, from an operator's viewpoint, of course, is, well, why am I going to build this thing? What are people going to buy off me if I build this thing? It's the same thing for governments. If we build this thing, what are people going to use it for? Well, I think you're going to get some of the answers in this session. Uh, we have a very varied uh, group of speakers, and I'm going to introduce them as they get up to speak. Um, the first speaker um, is a person I met some months ago. Um, I was very sorry when I met him because uh, if he hadn't been offered a job by Vodafone, I'd have offered him a job. Uh, is Khalifa Salah Haroun. Um, he's not here representing Vodafone. Vodafone have a separate speaker. However, he's here um, as a young Qatari who set up his own website, I love Qatar.net. He will also talk about Qatar living, a lot of other content ventures he's taken. Khalifa, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say that I'm not the, the most uh, uh, best person when it comes to giving presentations. Um, if you want to, to sit around the table, you know, have some shisha, talk from the heart. I'm the person that you should come to. Um, I just wanted to start it off with a little bit of a dream moment. Now, I remember growing up, watching television and uh, hearing from my Western friends at, uh, in a Western school, which I studied at, that it was all about the American dream. I remember thinking, wow, it's fantastic. You know, all I need to do is step foot in America, and the first thing I, c I can do is anything. Uh, on a side note, I remember when I went off to university that uh, the first thing that a lot of uh, Arabs did were, 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 were di was dye, dye, dye their hair. They would dye their hair, change it color, and when I asked them why, it was just because it was a symbol of freedom, they said. If you look at Qatar today, I can definitely say that there's a lot of freedom. Freedoms that my father, perhaps, wasn't able to, 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 to enjoy. Nowadays, it seems to me that I can probably go as far as calling it the Qatari dream, if not the, if not the Gulf or GCC dream. Where else can you find a country with so much opportunity? Thinking about it, you know, just quite simply, I mean, where something's done in the UK or in the US and you can go ahead and apply it into Qatar, or, you know, where there isn't that much competition if you think about it, and where people or the public will part with the reals so easily. Where so many see flaws, I see opportunities. It's fantastic because anybody can go ahead and just complain and rant and say that they, 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 there's no opportunity for them in, in Qatar or in the GC or in the Middle East because of bureaucracy. That's where a smart individual will come in and say, oh my God, it's my chance to try and make that change. So many people see that, many people or Arabs in Qatar see that the best way to, 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 to bring over a business or start up a venture is by bringing over a franchise. That's not what I agree with. I think that at the end of the day, if, as a Qatari, I would love to export a brand rather than import it. It's up to the Qatari market to learn, adapt, and improve upon what's already available. So if we're looking at something that can make the biggest socioeconomic impact, then I think it's online and e-commerce, and that's the way forward. So I'm going to be talking about three topics, understanding the region, types of Arabic sites, and support for e-commerce in the region. Now, to understand the region, a lot of people seem to make the mistake of lumping the, all Arabic countries into the Middle East and thinking, okay, I'm going to target the Middle East. It's a common mistake that not many people realize their error of their ways until it's too late, two, three years after creating a website. 
let's, for example, you know, if you look at Egypt, Egypt is a completely different, different in terms of uh, the culture and concept, in terms of the society, in terms of openness in comparison to Syria or Qatar or Bahrain or any other Arabic country. So when I was in university, somebody asked me, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Qatar. The person replied, oh, I know Dubai. So I stopped, I looked at him, and I said, that's the equivalent of you to ask me asking you, oh, where are you from? You say, well, I'm from London. I say, oh, I know France. It just doesn't make sense. So sites, as I mentioned, seem to take more than they can handle, focusing on a whole Middle East because it's a wider audience. They think about, let me capture as many people as possible, rather than thinking about the quality of the content that they have. What that restricts them from, from an e-commerce point of view, is that the most obvious issue is when it comes to logistics. If I wanted to sell a product in, 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 in Qatar and I decided to, and I was, I was based out of Lebanon, it would be extremely difficult for me to sell a product to uh, somebody in another Arabic country. I should focus on Lebanon. Um, more importantly, Arabs from different countries don't feel that they can connect emotionally. If I go into a website that targets all Arabs, I don't feel like the, it means much to me as an individual, as a Qatari. I want to see a site that has a bit of slang or Qatari dialect in it. I want to see a site that makes me feel that I'm important. So the whole point is that if there's anything, if, if anything, the Gulf could be grouped together, you can have the Al-Sham grouped together, and you can have, you know, African... Arab countries group together. My point here is to focus. So here are a few examples of some Arabic, popular Arabic website. We have Kura, we have Doha.com, and we have Qatar Shares. So what do all these popular sites look like at the moment? The, if you notice, if you look at the, the general layout of the site, you can see that the income comes from advertisements, and most of them are either social and information based. They are very busy. So there's a number of, uh, number of reasons which I've come up with for the reason for why the sites end up looking the way that they do. Number one, font. It's tiny. It's so amazingly difficult to see anything that's uh, at, set at 12 points, even at 14 points. So that means we need larger fonts. Larger fonts means that there'll be less room to place content. And that's a good thing, in my opinion. Let's look at language. If you're targeting the Middle East, you're probably going to have to write the site in, in formal Arabic. That's not personal, and if it's written in Qatari, other nationals might not understand it. And if you want some examples, see me after the conference, and I'll give you some inappropriate examples of how Arabic can be misunderstood across different countries. The CMS. So there aren't many content management systems that uh, consider Arabic the Arabic language. If I wanted to simply highlight something using, uh, let's use a CMS, Far Cry. If I wanted to highlight, it's extremely difficult just trying to capture that, that, that Arabic word because it's constantly trying to shift between left and right alignment. Then we look at the designs. The designs are very cluttered, similar to what's common in Japan and in China. But the point is that sites aren't aesthetically pleasing. Why are they popular even though they don't look that nice? Because people are desperate for information. So, again, the lesson is simplify and focus. We also need a bit of support when it comes to e-commerce. So how can we increase broadband uptake in the region? E-commerce is the way. There are a number of sites, for example. We can look at Vodafone. We can look at Qatar Airways. And we can also see various attempts at creating online markets. The biggest thing holding people back, though, is an adequate postal service, in my opinion. So the other four points that I have are ease of access. We need to bear in mind that whenever you create a, product, a website, you need to make sure that as many people on any device can connect. Let's look at the mobile device. Um, a lot of people have had their first experience online on their mobile in Qatar. So why don't we create more mobile dedicated sites? Then we have the connections. It's not really that easy to, 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 to find a connection in Qatar, and I hope I wish it was. We need to make it easier for them. That's where the, tele, the telecoms industry comes in. 3G, in my opinion, is what everybody thought Wi-Fi was going to be. I remember my father, when he first bought a Wi-Fi-enabled laptop, he went out to the garden and said, why don't I have internet? And it took me actually a couple of hours to actually explain the concept behind that. But, um, so, so why have people not been as active in the online sphere? 
Well, a couple of example, uh, reasons I've thought of are the price of domains in the Middle East. It's only until quite recently that prices have decreased, but even then a domain costs um, around 200 riyals compared to the $10 for a dot-com domain. It used to be that people have uh, it used to be that people had to set up a business so that they could get a domain name. It's changed now, but that means that I couldn't, I couldn't start an online business because I had to have a high street business first. That really goes against helping, encouraging people to set up online businesses. The other three points, lack of confidence. A lot of people don't understand the benefits of an online business or expanding your business online. The most common thing I hear is, no, people just want to come and walk into a shop. Why? Why, why? why does an individual have to come into the shop? That goes, leads into infrastructure. Besides education, we have a serious issue when it comes to the postal system. I can't order something and have it sent over to my house unless I use an extremely expensive courier service. At the moment, a product has to be reserved and picked up at a post box or in a store. So why should I sell something? Why should I buy something online? Why wouldn't I just simply go into a franchise or a branch and uh, pick up the item myself or I could see it in my hand? Then finally, I end up with regulations. We need, to ha we need to incentivize people into creating online businesses. Possible suggestions could be to make it easier for, for, for people to set up businesses. What about allowing people to set up businesses at home? What about a guide for how to start up an online business? What licenses or permits do I need? And so on. So Qatar is already a melting pot of different nationalities and cultures and it shouldn't be that difficult in my opinion for, for, for us to, to, to move on with, that, you know, with that, the new era. It's funny how the, the, the technology bubble or the online bubble was uh, something that we thought passed, especially in the West, but now it's coming to the Middle East. Um, a forum on a website is nothing more than an online majlis. We're used to sitting in a majlis. We know, we discuss, we, 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 we share information, we get to know each other. We can do this online. And the irony of all of this, which I want to end it with, is that whenever I step into people's majlises, I notice that a lot of the guests sitting there all have their laptops whipped out and are connected online. So it works both ways. Create an online majlis or bring online to the majlis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khalifa, for those interesting insights into setting up a website here in Qatar, and uh, some regulatory issues for us. Our next speaker is uh, Jan Holzberg, who is Head of Product Management at Vodafone Qatar. Um, Vodafone has been operating in the market here for about um, eight or nine months now. Uh, as regulator, I won't make any comment, um, other than the competition is starting and is going well, and we hope to see it develop. And I hope Jan will give us some insight into the Vodafone way thinking about products and content. Thanks. Excellent. Um, first things first, um, salam alaikum, guten tag, uh, good afternoon. Um, I've been with the uh, Vodafone Group now about 11 years in various different functions and I've had the privilege uh, 14 months ago to be sent on assignment to our most exciting local market, uh, which is Qatar. And uh, looking at the challenge that we are discussing today, which is how to boost uptake of consumer broadband, um, I would like to share two concrete examples with you where we think from a Vodafone perspective we have been successful in actually stimulating consumer demand in that space. Um, I'd like to combine that with a little bit of a personal story. So when I, when I came to Qatar and I was uh, looking at our initial product portfolio, um, I was consulting uh, various different you know, experts and of course secondary market research uh, on the region and on Qatar. And uh, there were a few common assumptions uh, on the potential of particularly mobile internet in Qatar that were shared with me. The first thing people told me is that in Qatar, um, there is of course a big share of the population which is migrant workers who are helping uh, with the industry uh, and overall growth uh, of the construction in, in Qatar. And uh, obviously it was very clear in people's mind that mobile internet is not relevant for the migrant worker. Why is that? That's very obvious. One, these people lack capable phones. And two, um, really if you look at particularly blue collar construction work workers, you would assume that there's a limited literacy. So really mobile internet, not for them. It's not like in the West. Uh, then we looked at a different segment, um, which is the locals. So 
that of course includes the local Qatari population, but uh, also I would say an extended uh, segment of customers where you would say local Arabs who are living here in, uh, in Qatar permanently. Um, and then again, what I was told by, uh, told by industry experts and consultants out of Dubai and out of secondary research, mobile internet really not relevant for that segment. One, lack of relevant content. So less than 1% actually of uh, the mobile available content is in Arabic. And then two, um, there's a really low uh, mobile internet penetration in the region. So look at the vast majority of the market, really mobile internet smelled like a niche. Where we took it from a Vodafone perspective, we said, okay, let's turn this upside down. One, because we think there's a real consumer opportunity with mobile internet, and two, we were new to the market. So we really had no revenue that we need to forego. Yeah? So uh, therefore we said, okay, let's, let's give this a go. Yeah? Let's challenge ourselves, but first and foremost, let's challenge this market to see what uh, mobile internet adoption can be if it's free. And what we did uh, was to launch to all of our customers, so that included um, people who were on an account and people who were on prepaid, free mobile internet. Not only we launched free mobile internet, but uh, we wanted to give customers usage occasions. Usage occasions that are actually relevant to them to use the mobile internet. Um, and that included, of course, next to Google, um, favorite email services, uh, also content. And then content that really appeals to everyone in Qatar, like Al Jazeera, for example, um, or you know, cricket scores for the workers, or um, social network uh, for um, some of the, the local population. We keep extending that. So one is take price out of the equation. Two, provide usage occasions and relevant content. Um, and three, provide an experience that is radically easy to use. So that was the missing bit. And the way we achieved that is that we leveraged a global Vodafone platform um, which automatically configured all of the phones that would be using a Vodafone SIM card with the right settings. So anyone could use it, it was available to all customers, um, and it was free. So now, um, if I may uh, ask the round, uh, I, you know, I understand we have a lot of uh, industry experts here today from you know, various different parts of the globe. Um, what do you think? in percentage of our total customer base, so these are all of the uh, customers that we have acquired so far, end of December, these were 350,000 customers. How many of these, in percentage, do you think are actively using the mobile internet? That means at least once per month they are browsing and using the phone for mobile internet, in percentage. Sorry? And all of them? Well, that's very audacious. I would love to see that. Uh, any, any more views? Eight? Eight zero. Eight zero, 80, great, wow. How much? Three zero, 30 percent? Forty percent? I think I think these are uh, very audacious uh, estimations. Um, to give you a little bit of a feeling, the industry uh, is around uh, 13 percent uh, in, in the West. What we have seen in the Vodafone group is that the highest penetration has been 38 percent. And where we are at currently uh, in Qatar is 60% active customers. So 60% of our 350,000 customers are going online at least once per month. That means that Qatar in this case is not only leading the region when it comes to mobile internet penetration, and not only leading here as a local market, where I could go back actually to Vodafone Group and share with pride that we have the highest penetration of mobile internet adoption, and also bear in mind other markets had been doing promotions as well. Um, there's another piece of uh, statistics I'd like to share with you. 50% of these people who were using the mobile internet were actually going through our uh, mobile internet webpage. That's the thing you see here on the, on the right-hand side. So 50% of these were actually finding the usage occasions that we have given and the ideas of what to do with, uh, with mobile internet, so Google, Google search, email, Facebook, Al Jazeera, etc., quite relevant. And certainly, Cricket Scores was amongst the most popular destinations for workers. So one example of how you can actually boost um, consumer uptake of a mobile internet or a broadband proposition in general uh, is mobile internet. The second one I would like to give you is e-commerce, in this case, um, um, our online store. So when we came to Qatar, uh, again, what experts told us, people pay, pay with cash. People go into uh, stores and buy their stuff there. Online really has no opportunity. Again, we said, let's turn it on our head. 
Um, we launched uh, the whole Vodafone Qatar operation online exclusively. You could only pay with a credit card. And we had an exclusive offer, which was number reservation. So any number on the Vodafone network could be reserved through that portal. What happened in the first few days is actually our server crashed. We were able to recover that within 24 hours, but what we saw was millions, millions of searches on numbers, and actually all of the transaction going through our portal. I think Khalifa has already uh, alluded to this. Uh, one of the big challenges was the logistics, so we had to partner with a local um, logistics company to actually deliver the phones and the SIMs to uh, our customer's house. Um, but what we have seen is that these common myth around barriers to consumer adoption and barriers to um, adoption of online service are actually not true if you get the experience right, if you get the offer right, and uh, if, you, if you just seriously undertake uh, uh, this type of venture. So we still have uh, online now up and running as one of our major distribution channels, and it's doing well. Um, we are second placed after Qatar Airways in terms of transaction. Let me conclude on uh, giving a few thoughts on what it takes to specifically stimulate consumer broadband demand. Um, one is, and I think I spoke about that already, is a genuine understanding of segments. So don't second guess. Have the customer in mind, not the technology. The second one is service ubiquity. So instead of thinking about DSL, fiber, 3G, LTE, WiMAX, national backbone, think around ubiquity of access. So think about the various different usage occasions where customers, so consumers and businesses, are needing the internet and then build for purpose. Uh, the third one is obvious but key. Simplicity and ease of use. Simplicity in the way you buy the product, simplicity in the way you connect and configure the product, but simplicity also in the way you actually design the offer. Uh, the fourth point, and that is of course relative to the occasion, is speed and bandwidth. So anything you launch needs to be at least 500k in terms of speed. Um, last but not least, you know, innovative offers are also key to the success. So I think one good tendency to do is to do best practice all around the world and see you know, what has been done elsewhere and bring the best to Qatar. But the challenge that I would like to put is to think about specifically innovative offers that are invented in Qatar and that will work here and that then will drive behavior. So offers can actually drive behavior. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, competition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for that very concise and interesting insight into the uh, initial months of competition in our market here. Our, our next speaker is, and you've heard him already, is uh, Rob Middlehurst, who is Deputy General Director of the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority in Bahrain. We felt that to balance this panel, we wouldn't just have uh, service providers and content providers, um, of which we have two more, uh, but we also needed to get a regulatory perspective on this. Rob, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Listening yesterday and today brought some other sort of home truths to me, some realizations, one of which is age. There was a comment earlier about if you're born after the 80s, you're sort of a digital era child. If you're born before the 80s, you're a migrant. So those who were born in the 60s and beforehand, where do we live? Because uh, we grew up in a world of sort of Alan Irwin and Gene Roddenberry, we had Lost in Space, we had Star Trek, we had books by Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, and we had this world which was being drawn for us, which is somewhere in the realms of science fiction. As we've grown up, all of a sudden we've realized that science fiction is here today. We all use it today. The vast majority of the things that were available then, some form of handheld portable computer, some form of scanner, that would give you medical advice or diagnosis. They were all the realms of these people in the 60s and early 70s. Today they exist. The concept of teleportation is still one which is probably 100 or 200 years away, certainly for a, a sentient being anyway. But there are technologies available today that have moved protons from one atomic structure to a different atomic structure. So teleportation does exist, but not for things that are living. And that raises a whole philosophical question about if you disintegrate someone and reconstitute them, is it the same person? Yeah, has a new life been created and all that? And I think those are problems which are going to be resolved sometime in the future. But I think something else that was brought home just in uh, Khalifa's presentation was that 
we still have a lot to learn. And as a regulator, we have a huge amount to learn. The rate at which this industry is changing, the rate in which we've moved from semaphore, you know, flags, how do we communicate to each other, letter post, the introduction of the printing press before that, and then we move to telegraph, eventually to telephone. Now we move to this brave world of the internet in which voice over IP is commonplace and used. Illegal in some countries, not in others. Um, the rate of change is accelerating and accelerating, but the rate of regulation is not necessarily catching up with it. And we have to start thinking in new ways of saying, well, if all of these things are going to be delivered by these super high-speed networks, irrespective of whether they're in wireless or whether they're on fixed communications, then at what point does the regulator say, I can step back from this? Now, we talked a little bit about things like broadband networks and whether the government gets involved, whether there's state intervention, whether or not uh, incumbents will develop the networks on their own. And maybe that's where the secret lies. If we go into the cloud world, then applications, you know, Skype to this world, gizmos, whatever, they just live in the cloud. They don't live anywhere else. So when we start regulating them, we have to ask, why are we regulating them? What service are we regulating? In what jurisdiction are we regulating? What license or what legal instruments are in place to allow us to regulate? And then a more fundamental question of why are we regulating? If we look at the base level, we can see very clear links and say broadband, okay, it's, a tech, it's, a, it's an infrastructure. We can understand the building blocks of that. It's like building the road. If one company controls it, we can understand how to regulate that to allow others to come into it. We're now moving from relatively slow speeds to what we conceive to be phenomenal speeds. But again, it's another generational thing. When the first international cables were laid across the transatlantic, or the transatlantic cables, people believed they would last for indefinitely. Huge amounts of capacity. A few years later, they put another one in. A few years later, they put another one in. A few years later, and so on. And right now, they're putting another one in. The bandwidth growth is just always there. There's always a need. This is being consumed in some respects by the likes of Google, by the likes of MySpace, Facebook, etc. Again, we have problems in how to regulate, or should we regulate? And then it comes to the question of, well, what would we regulate? Do we regulate content? Is the, the role of a, a regulator in the future nothing more than a censor? It's an interesting question because you know, if the networks are ubiquitous and affordable to everybody, if we have this superhighway that is constantly being regenerated and made faster and faster and faster, and the access regime is put in a way that allows everyone to have access to it, then you know, have we achieved the original view of uh, Carlsberg, which said job finished when he left his sessions at Oftel in the very early days of regulation. Content is a whole new world. As a telecoms regulator, it's like sort of opening a Pandora's box. What should we do? How far should we go? And in certain parts of the world, particularly in an Arab world and in an Islamic world, there are very strong moral codes. Now, there could be a, rule, a role there for regulation within those moral codes. In other parts of the world where those moral codes aren't the same, is the role of the regulator the same? So there's a cultural issue that starts to come into it. And it becomes a lot more blurred as we move through the different varieties of what content is. Now, a question posed was, you know, IPR infringements, theft. Should we be regulating that? And you look at the technologies that sit behind it, things like BitTorrent, okay, or organizations like Napster and things of that nature. BitTorrent is just a technology. So would we regulate BitTorrent? The answer is no. The use of BitTorrent may lead to illegal activities. But as we've heard uh, yesterday, I think it was, some countries actually use BitTorrent in other ways. It's very productive as a government means of disseminating information. Okay. So applications that sit within it could be absolutely perfectly legal, and we wouldn't want to touch it. You then look at, the, the, say, the music industry or the film industry. Since companies like Napster or sites like Napster were created, 
Has, it, has illegal download of music damaged the industry? It's a different, difficult question to answer because if you look at the finances that sit behind it, okay, you've got one or two record labels at the moment which are going through some difficult times. That's not necessarily because of the illegal download of their contents. It might well be more about they've failed to diversify their base and move into new media. They've failed to take on artists who are willing to use the internet as the primary means of distribution of their content. But if you look at the overall revenue from the music industry, it continues to, to grow year on year. And yet the level of illegal download still continues to increase. So is it damaging? Now, a few months ago, my daughter came home from school. And she's 12 years old. Her ICT teacher had set some homework. And there were 12 questions she was asked. The first question was, is illegal download of music bad? Very simple question. Please discuss. And the first question to me was, what's illegal download of music, Dad? She said, she goes on iTunes. She says, is iTunes illegal? I go, no, you pay for that on iTunes. She said, well, what's illegal download then? So you start to explain to her. And she goes, well, what about the artists? Do they get any money for it? No. What about the companies who would normally produce the, the music? Do they get any money for it? No. She said, well, in that case, it's got to be bad. I said, but what about all your friends who've got the latest music and you all listen to it? And she said, oh, it's great. So there's this different set of values, which there's a generational change coming in. And you know, as we heard yesterday, there's a need in the internet for things to be immediate. There's a need on the internet for things to be free. There's a need for them to be the latest, the greatest, whatever it might be. But it has to be there. Okay. From a regulatory perspective, would we look at regulating IPR for infringement? The answer is no. It's not a regulatory issue. It's a legal issue. And one of the problems is companies who are suffering from IPR infringement think it's a regulatory issue because it happens on telecommunications networks. Okay. So they come to the regulator and yeah, we all in the Middle East suffer this one, Dreambox. Okay. Showtime and Orbit scream and shout all the time because Dreambox accesses its content for $30 a year and send us $30 a month. Now, the reality is Showtime and Orbit should take them to court. They should sue them for IPR infringements. They should sue them for theft. Okay. It's not a regulatory issue. All we can regulate is not that type of activity, but we can put in place things that say operators shouldn't knowingly allow illegal activity on their network. That may make them think a little bit about the types of content they allow. And I think I've got about a minute left. Now, that raises another question. It's a, it's a fundamental question about business. On the one hand, we say, I want to build my business, and I'm going to build server farms, I'm going to build co-location space. I'm going to fill that with as many business applications and customers as I possibly can. So great, we build all these lovely big warehouses effectively with great air conditioning systems and international connectivity and power. We fill them with servers, with many, many different companies operating in this very small space. But do we ever sit and ask, what's the business they're conducting? And the answer is very rarely. I worked as an operator for most of my life, and uh, working life anyway, and very rarely did we ask, what's the nature of the business you're conducting? What's the nature of the content you host on your servers? And it creates some interesting problems because we all let's go back to the moral code and cultural issues. No one likes to see immoral content. No one likes to see um, content that's, shall we say, on the risque side. No one likes to see their children exposed to that. However, I would, I would argue with virtually every operator in this room that every one of them has servers which have that type of content on it. It might not be viewable in this country, but it certainly is viewable in a different country. So the world of regulation starts to go into a very grey area which is, do we start telling people what they can and can't do in their businesses rather than asking them to open that business to other people? So if we then go back to the very first question, which is how do we stimulate demand in broadband? I think the answer is we have to create a very broad broadband path. Now, whether that's done through public-private partnership, whether that's done through private endeavour, as a debate which is going to run for another quite a long period of time. But once we have that in place and we have the access regimes in place, 
then the need to stimulate comes from the operators, not from the regulator. We've put in place the environment that allows business to develop. We've put in place the rules that allow networks to operate and interoperate with each other. And we shouldn't be governing the retail businesses of those organizations themselves. If there are legal issues that are involved, that comes through different mechanisms and not through the regulator. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, se several thoughts there, near and dear to my own heart. Regulators always agree. Um, the next speaker is Mohammed Nanabi from Head of Online at Al Jazeera English. Al Jazeera is a very well-known brand, uh, known for its TV, uh, but it's also becoming increasingly known for its websites. Mohammed, floor is yours. Good afternoon. Asalaamu As Alaikum. So, I just want to take a bit of a step back. I think um, my colleagues before me have laid a great foundation for what I'm going to say today. Because I'm really going to focus on two things. One is entrepreneurship and how do we drive the businesses and start the businesses that are really going to fuel the demand that we need to grow broadband penetration. And the second part is just to look a bit about the content and look at some of the intellectual property issues around them. Um, and if you step back and you start to think, if we're talking about broadband and driving broadband, what does that mean? At the end, it means how are we going to drive content? That's all it is. What's the content that we're going to push down these pipes? Um, so then you start asking yourselves, how do we get to the point where we have content producers? So it's fine to have an Al Jazeera, which is you know, now we're in the business for 14 years, um, a worldwide international news channel with a network of sports channels, um, well-funded, um, going around and you know you can have the BBC and you can have these other big companies um, but that's only half of the story because when you really start looking at the traffic online um, lots of traffic comes to us lots of traffic may go to Vodafone and your airways but most of the traffic are really going to companies that were started by two guys in a garage so I want to just step back and talk about that a bit and how do we try to encourage that within the broader region because I think when we start seeing these two guys in the garage starting these companies that's when you're really going to see a broad, broadband take off, you can see lo content localized, and you're really going to start seeing the innovation happen. So if I can just take you back to um, the pre-internet era, um, and when people were trying to innovate, it was really hard. You know, it was governments and corporations and experts and bodies and panels um, and funding papers and research departments and all sorts of things. And to get anything done required a lot of work and a lot of effort. But if we move forward to the internet era, the era that we're in at the moment, innovation is totally different. It's simple, it's fast, and there's a number of components making up this ecosystem. And what the challenge that we face now, especially in this region, is how do we nurture this ecosystem? So, you know, if we just look at this, when you start looking at you know, how these companies form up, you start looking at what this ecosystem looks like, and it's, and it's simple. Innovation's at the edge. It's not in the center. It's not with some centralized body. It's pushed out to the edge. It's the companies on the edge. It's the people on the edge. It's entrepreneurs, um, the venture capitalists who are funding it. And it's all built on top of this cloud, which we call the internet. And underlying this are sets of standards that are open. Um, everybody can plug into them. Everybody can use them. There's a stack that works. There's an open source layer around it, which makes it cheap and easy for people to start building on. So if you, if you look at the, uh, Google or the next Google, what are they going to build it on? You know, it's going to be two guys out at Qatar University or Qatar Foundation, um, and they're going to have a web server that costs, you know, a couple of dollars to rent a month. That web server is going to be running Apache software, which is free. Um, it's going to be running a MySQL database. It's going to be running on a Linux operating system. All of these components are free. Um, and these are solid platforms which everybody uses, from Google to Facebook to Yahoo um, to Al Jazeera itself. And so the cost to entry is cheap. It's nearly nothing. It trends towards zero. When you look at when Google was started, it was two guys in Stanford running servers in their bedrooms in a dormitory. So the cost to start something up, as it tends towards zero, what it means is the cost of failure goes to zero as well. It's cheap to fail. Now, we always look at failure as a bad thing. You failed. You, you know, it might be shameful to start something and have it fail. But the only way you're actually going to get to, to the next big idea is by failing, and failing multiple times. Because you're going to strike that one thing that takes off. And because it costs us so little to fail multiple times, it, that's the only way we're going to succeed in innovating and trying things out. And especially in this time 
when business models are uncertain, no one knows how are we going to make money of news, how are we going to make money of music a couple of years ago when Napster was around. Everybody was trying to figure this out. No one could sit down and you couldn't get um, McKinsey to come and tell you how it's going to be done because no one knew. Everybody was trying to figure it out. So the only way you could do it was by trying it. By have a group of entrepreneurs in your organization outside and let them try it. Try a couple of things, you fail, you throw it out after six months. If they're good entrepreneurs, they'll pivot, they'll change direction and they'll make a success out of it. So this cost of failure is critical. You know, and this is what we should be encouraging people. Try it, fail. Now there's a whole ecosystem around this, right? It's not just Joe walks up the street and decides to start a company. There has to be people who can fund these companies. There has to be venture capitalists and angel investors around them. There needs to be people who can acquire these companies so they can have a liquidity event. And then once you're acquired, they're going to go in and fund the next generation of entrepreneurs. So it's this whole ecosystem that needs to be nurtured and built. So if we just go to a, and zoom in on Qatar itself, if you look at the Qatari market and you, know, you look at the Lexar numbers, which are the best we have, if you look at the players, who are the big players on the web? You know, you're looking at Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, Facebook, Wikipedia, and Qatar Living. So that's what you have. Those are your big six, eventually. Right? Now the interesting thing about all of them, uh, you know, all of them were started by two guys in a basement. That's what they are, or a guy in his dormitory at university. These are your big players driving your consumer demand. If you, you know, I'm sure my colleagues from Vodafone will tell you this. All the traffic's going to Google, it's going to YouTube, it's going to Facebook. You know, they, it's going to Flickr where people are posting these photos. This is where the traffic's going. All these companies were started by two guys with no funding. At some point they raised a little bit of money. They probably got angel investors who gave them $100,000. They ran these companies, then they went up and raised some venture capital and they built them into billion dollar businesses. Google's market cap, you know, it's a bad month this month. It's about $170 million, uh, billion. Dollars. So eventually this is what you need to do. You need, and there's no, there's no reason why the next Google couldn't be out of this region. There's no reason why you couldn't. We've, it just means we need to get the ecosystem right. We need to have all the pieces in place where we can promote entrepreneurs and get young people. Um, that's what was nice here in Khalifa starting um, this talk, talking about entrepreneurship. People trying these things and looking at the scale. This market's a great market in the Middle East. There's 300 million people. They all speak the same language. It's, it's on the cusp of taking off. It's the same place where Japan was a couple of years ago. So it's about to explode. And it's just enabling people so they can start and build these things. No one's going to build it. There's no institution that's going to come out and put a grand strategy together to build this. And that's really what's going to drive demand, drive entrepreneurship. It's going to solve a lot of problems uh, for this region. And so, as I said, this is all built on the stack, right? It's sort of this open source stack, this open stack that we have of these web standards, um, of the protocols that we use, of the software that we use. Um, so, let me just talk a bit about content. Because when you look at the stack, you know, it's easy for people to understand what Apache is and it's the web server that everything runs on, right? But if you keep going up higher in the stack, you know, you get to your database, you get your application, and then you're looking at the content on top of it. And this becomes a critical question. And this is what uh, uh, my colleague just spoke about earlier when his daughter asked the question about what's an illegal download. And eventually, you know, when you look at that, what we've been doing, what we've been doing as industry, as a society, is criminalizing an entire generation of our children. We've criminalized our children when we've tried to throw them in jail because they've downloaded a song or downloaded a movie. Now, it might not be right. We know that. It's, you know, it's, it's morally wrong. You're downloading. But those laws don't apply now because when your daughter, who's 12 years old or 6 years old, grabs that file and you've created an environment where it's become illegal for them, we've criminalized our children. And what we need to do is step back and say, is there another way? You know, yes, it, you know, we shouldn't be stealing content. We shouldn't be stealing anything. So is there a third way that we can move towards? And one of the things as Al Jazeera is, we've been really interested in that. How can we find that third way? And how can we contribute to developing that third way? Um, so one of, the, one of the important developments for this is, we've got lots of content, right? We're Al Jazeera. We create this great news. Everybody in the Middle East watch our Arab, watches our Arabic news channel. So our challenge has been, since we've launched our English channel, is how do we break into markets across the world? How do we go global with this? Um, and the internet's been a key factor for us. Um, one of the big markets we're trying to get into is North America and to get into the US market. So we've been using online to push this. So what we did was, at the time, and if you look two, two three years ago, there was this whole war against YouTube, right? Viacom, there was, you know, there was lawsuits going on and everyone was pulling their content off YouTube um, and all this stuff was going on and everyone was trying to figure out what do you do with YouTube because everyone's going to YouTube to watch the video. And we turned around and said, no, you know, if, if the audience is going to YouTube, that's where we should be. We should be where the audience is. So we developed a strategy that we call distributed distribution. 
That's, instead of just looking at linear distribution, we take our signal, we put it up onto a satellite or down an IT, IPTV pipe with a cable operator. Let's put it out there on the internet. And let's put it onto YouTube. And not only is it on YouTube where everybody is, everybody's going to watch video on YouTube, but people then, our audience, people who love our content, who enjoyed our content, would further distribute it for us because they could then take that YouTube video and embed it on their blog, on their website, and push it further along. So there was a, there was a next step in this distribution. So it wasn't just Google doing it for us. It was now our fans, our audience, who was distributing our content further. And that's what you really want. You want people who are passionate about your product to be doing your distribution. So you turn, you turn your customers into your marketers. So our content is about 20,000 videos online from Al Jazeera. You can find our full programming up on YouTube. And what this means is over a billion minutes of video have been watched since we started this. Um, and this is phenomenal for a broadcaster out of Qatar, being able to reach audiences across the world. Most of, half of our traffic comes from the US. So people from the US are watching Al Jazeera, both Arabic and English, um, consuming this content produced here in Doha. So we thought, well, this is great. We can now distribute our content and people can see it. Whoever wants to watch it can watch it. So what do we do next? What's the next step on top of this? Is there something else we can do? So you can take it, you can view it, you can share it. Now, there's, 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 in the creative process, it doesn't stop there, right? Because you might want to take that content and maybe you want to create your own documentary. Um, you know, maybe there's, there's, you want to share it with your students at class. So what we said was, can we enable this? And this is where, when we start talking about copyright and talking about IP, this is where you know, we found a solution. So there's something called Creative Commons, which was started out by Professor Lawrence Lessig, who was at Stanford and Harvard. Um, and he's a, you know, one of the great... Uh, <coughs> intellectual property lawyers and constitutional lawyers in the States. Um, and he said, how do we solve this problem? How do we not criminalize our children? And he said, well, you know, if we have on one hand copyright, which is all rights reserved, and you can't do anything with what we have, and you have on the other hand people stealing things, which is illegal, there must be somewhere in the middle. And what somewhere in the middle means is there's some rights reserved. These are my rights. I have them. It's my content. But I'll give some of those rights to you. So what we did was we said, this is our content, we've created it, it's great content. It's Al Jazeera content, filmed by our uh, cameramen and our reporters in the field. Uh, it's world-class content, you're not gonna find better. We've, we, we're in places in, where no one else is. And we'll give it to you. You take it, you use it, you build upon it. You know? And this is how knowledge is created, right? This is how we create knowledge at universities, this is how we create uh, knowledge. We stand on those who came before us. So we said we put it out there and let filmmakers use it. So we licensed it to them, and we started this just after the war in Gaza uh, because we were the only English language broadcaster with people in Gaza. So we took this content, we put it out there, and it was amazing to see what happened. We put it up um, during, midway through in January, and suddenly, in, in, a, in a matter of hours, literally, out, after sending out the press release saying, Al Jazeera has done this, we're the first, commercial, first broadcast in the world to do this and give away our content in this manner, the Wikipedia community, the you know, people built encyclopedia, they grabbed this content and said, hey, we've, we're talking about this war, but we've got no visuals for it because it doesn't exist. Everything's copyrighted. But you've given this to us, so we've taken it and put it into our encyclopedia. So now it's contributed to the collective knowledge of society, and it'll always be there in Wikipedia. So we're enabling this creativity. Suddenly, after this, teachers started taking it at universities, teaching their journalism students how to cut up video, how to use it. It was used by NGOs. It was used by other news broadcasters, broadcasters in Europe, broadcast our footage. They don't have access to footage from Gaza. Now they were broadcasting our news. So we enabled this life cycle that will just continue and continue. And it's amazing to see where it ends up. This video was used in video games, music videos, all sorts of places. And th so this is the culture of entrepreneurship, of creativity that we're trying to enable and support. So this was our repository where you can go up, get the video, download it, import it into your favorite video editing software, cut it up and reuse it, make a documentary. So finally, just to tie this all together, you know, and, and if anything that you take away from this talk is just we need to create and foster entrepreneurship in this region. That's the only way we'll be draw, drive, not only to drive broadband, not only to create great businesses like Google and so on, which need to come out of this region, but to help our youth, you know, to give them the chance to build something, to build something they can be proud, they're proud of and we're proud of. So one of my good friends who started, who started a, a company called Yamli, which is an Arabic, trans, you know, it, you can type in Arabic and it, uh, enables Arabic on your web browser. He started an organization with the World Economic Forum called Yalla Startup. And, you know, and the whole idea is just to tell young people, Yalla, start up the company. You know, don't stick with the cushy job 
that you're going to get, that's going to be there. You can always go and work in the government or in whatever, in, in, at your father's business. But go out and start a company. Try it. The cost is so low. It costs nothing to start a business online. So, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll take some questions a bit later. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. Um, we're, we're now going to go from a um, very interesting concept there, and I think we could discuss it a bit in the discussion session about Creative Commons, to a man who's going to talk about the other side of it, intellectual property. Um, it's a Saint Spec Yusuf, who is Managing Director of Fairwood Music Arabia. Spec. Hi, everyone. I feel like there's a debate already starting inside my mind because uh, I've got uh, fairly different views on some of the stuff that's been discussed here. Um, just to give you a bit of background, I, uh, I run a company called Fairwood Music Arabia. We are the uh, largest music publisher uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. We represent uh, the music publishing catalogs of Universal Music Publishing Group and EMI which are the two largest music publishers in the world. So between those two catalogs and the number of independent catalogs we represent, um, close to about four million copyrights in this region, making us the largest uh, owner of musical copyrights um, in the region. The concept of musical copyrights, and I'm gonna talk about that because you know that's, uh, that's what I do, uh, kind of goes back to an ancient or not so ancient argument, which started in 1850 where a French composer walked into a restaurant and uh, you know, had his dinner and there was a band playing music and at the end of his dinner he called the manager over and he said, um, great meal, but uh, I'm not going to pay the bill until you pay me for the music that was played because your band was playing one of my compositions. And that started a debate uh, in the halls of justice in France, which eventually evolved into what we now know as modern copyright laws, which is essentially what a music publisher is. We protect the rights and the revenue streams owned uh, by songwriters and composers on behalf of them. Um, when we look at the core, que one of the core questions of the panel today, which is what particular kinds of content are likely to drive mass broadband um, uptake, I think we have to look at um, history as an indicator of the future to a certain extent. And if we look at um, similar markets, emerging markets, uh, who were on the cusp of a digital revolution, which I think is uh, starting to happen and develop in the Middle East, uh, we see that really um, uh, music plays an integral role in that. Um, on a mobile side, uh, most estimates would say that music is the most uh, kind of serviced area um, in initially through ringtones but now through ringbacks and uh, um, full stream uh, full streams and, and full downloads in fact the the two times that a mobile rang over the course of today it was two musical ringtones both times so I think that that's probably a good indication of how often uh, music is used um, in a mobile context and also in a digital context, even within YouTube where we're looking at film and TV now that broadband speeds are getting so fast, I think it's almost impossible to go on YouTube, press a video and not hear a piece of music that's somewhere in there uh, as part of the audiovisual product. So, uh, and also some of the most popular channels on YouTube are, are owned by the major labels like Universal. So, um, so I think that that's quite clear. There's no real question or debate about that. Um, I think that the question, though, itself um, uh, can be looked at again. In fact, um, Rupert Murdoch, who uh, I probably don't agree with on a lot of things, um, but uh, recently when they announced the Apple iPad, uh, there was a comment that he made which said um, they were asking what he thought about the Apple iPad and so on, and he said, content is not just king, it's the emperor of all things digital. And uh, he went on to say specifically about the iPad that um, it's not powered by batteries, it's powered by great content. And without that great content, it's nothing but an empty vessel. Um, and so, uh, although you know, we probably come from two very different worlds, myself and Rupert Murdoch, uh, I think that he's spot on on that. And today, um, I think there's a bigger question, uh, which is 
not just uh, what kinds of content are likely to drive that mass broadband uptake, but rather what can we do to create and facilitate uh, the creation of that content and, uh, and the delivery of that content to the Middle East. And I think that uh, that's the real question that we really have to analyze and look at. And I think that the basic, the biggest impediment that the Middle East has had, and I've had this publishing company now for two years, and when we launched out of Dubai, uh, we're still the only music publisher in the UAE, and um, within two years for us to become the, the kind of leader in the region, uh, I'd like to think it's because I'm a genius, but I also think that uh, it probably has a lot to do with the fact that um, music publishers have not wanted to enter the Middle East. And the reason for that, I, I, uh, I think, is because I think that there is a need for regulatory infrastructure. And I think that regulatory infrastructure needs to, uh, although there might be differing opinions on whether regulatory infrastructure uh, should be um, involved in things like Napster or what happens on mobile uh, kind of telecoms, um, you know, uh, by telecom operators, I think that regulatory infrastructure should always be on par and in step with, with law. And uh, there is law in Qatar and in the UAE and throughout the Middle East, and copyright law is protected. Um, what I think is interesting um, when looking at what that major impediment is, is the fact that uh, as a music publisher, I can tell you that uh, in the UK or Europe or in North America, for us to license music, now if we accept that music is such a major kind of integral part of content that's being distributed out uh, digitally or on mobiles, uh, then the next step is, well, okay, why isn't there more, why isn't iTunes? in the Middle East, for instance? Or why aren't there more legal services so that people can legally access music? Even if it's on a free basis, because there are lots of, there are, there's, there's services in the, in the UK, such as Spotify, which essentially supplies music for free, and it's based on an advertising revenue model. So why aren't any of these services available in the Middle East, and why are 300 million plus people, um, you know, essentially um, starved of that content? And the reason, I think, is because it's so difficult to license content because there, in, in other markets, we have a performing rights organization in place. Um, now, in the UK, if we use the UK as an example, PRS, the Performing Rights Society, acts on behalf of music rights uh, owners. And then you've got music, music users, which would be the broadcasters, the telcos, the radio stations, and so on. And on the other side, you've got the music creators. So the intermediary is the performing rights organization, which essentially aggregates all the content and supplies a license, one license or a number of licenses to a music user. But it's a simple process. We don't really have that in the Middle East. And actually, in the Gulf, there is not a single performing rights organization in place, which means that if somebody wants to license um, the universal EMI, Sony, and Warner Brothers catalog, and then go to Rotana for Arabic catalog, and then go to Alam Al Fan for, for, for more Arabic catalog, and go to T-Series for Indian catalog, they have to do eight, nine, ten deals. And for them to do those deals, what ends up happening is um, uh, you end up finding that a lot of people have uh, inflated uh, views of the value of their repertoire because there's no regulatory infrastructure in place, there's no standardization. So you go up to somebody and you say, hey, I want to license your music because I'm about to open a, uh, you know, a new uh, telco digital service, and they say, great, it's going to cost you a million dollars for ten songs, uh, and we want that in advance, please. Otherwise, don't use our music. And uh, if they want to use music because they want to supply music to their, uh, to their, their subscriber base, uh, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's no uh, fiscally responsible way for them to do it because there's no standardization in the marketplace. I believe that is the role of government um, and possibly with, re uh, with regulators uh, in concert to work together um, to try and put some sort of infrastructure in place to help facilitate that process so that we can deliver content. And um, going by some of the, the, the analogies that I saw um, uh, earlier on in, in the day where um, uh, we tend to talk about uh, roads and highways. I think it's kind of like, uh, I think it's because we both live in, in the UAE that we've got this Sheikh Zayed Road analogy. 
but um, uh, there's two analogies that come to mind immediately. One is uh, uh, the copyright law is there, but um, so that's the highway. You know, that's the highway is, is, is a city that we live in or the country that we live in, and people going 200 miles an hour uh, is just the way it goes until somebody puts up the speed cameras and tells you, well, actually, you're not allowed to do it. It doesn't mean that before the speed cameras were there, uh, you weren't allowed, you, that it was okay to go 200 miles an hour. It was still the law to go 100, but people were, um, people have to be coaxed into following uh, that law, and the speed camera is the regulatory infrastructure that needs to go up in place. The second analogy that I, I uh, that kind of came to mind as I was hearing uh, some of the guys talk is the idea that um, we're building a bridge here. We're building a bridge through all the technological innovations that we're talking about. The technological innovations through the access to broadband, uh, the wires, the machinery, whatever it takes to kind of create the facilitator to get broadband to, to the consumer, that's the bridge. But the, the island is the content. Otherwise, you have nothing to go to. And so uh, you can't just focus on providing the access. You have to provide some sort of foundation to deliver the content as well. And unless we, um, unless we, we look at that, I think we're missing a trick. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with, um, with a, a, a fairly simple idea, um, which I believe is being in the Middle East constantly inspires me um, because you're always on the cusp of doing something new and really pioneering uh, something new. You can, be on, you can be the guy to pioneer something, and that's, I suppose, what I'm trying to do in my own little way. But um, there's always a lot of focus on innovation. And uh, wherever you go, there's always the focus of being the best and the greatest, and let's innovate, and let's be the market leaders in whatever we're doing on a digital uh, basis or not, as some of the previous panels were saying. But there's also innovation uh, that we have to focus on uh, at a cultural level. And cultural innovation means that when you've got local artists, local creators, they are, it's the same as, uh, as the previous speaker where he was saying, well, we need to focus on entrepreneurship. Well, people creating copyrights, uh, people creating intellectual property are the entrepreneurs of the arts world. And we need to kind of protect those rights because what ends up happening is um, they end up getting left by the wayside and without some sort of infrastructure uh, in place, what we've seen by the United States or the UK or the European societies where uh, the quote-unquote creative economies have uh, really grown and boosted is that um, you can't really create, um, you can't create one without addressing the other. And, and the fact of the matter is uh, if you have a society where uh, content creators uh, aren't rewarded for innovating, then they won't innovate. And so you can't have um, a uh, Sting or Madonna or A.R. Rahman uh, coming out of the Arab world until uh, you do something about making sure that uh, that person can benefit from the, from the creation of his or her content. Um, and so the, the, the final point that I would leave on is, is the idea that we have to support innovators in music um, or arts uh, as content creators, which leads to facilitating and providing access to the content through some sort of performing rights organization in the Gulf so that we, we are able to deliver content to people in an easy way. Um, and the positive side to that is that it's not just about paying uh, copyright owners, but the consumption of indigenous content regionally means that uh, the society as a whole in the region will benefit from that, but even better uh, is that that music will end up getting exported around the world so that we can see uh, we can see the sort of uh, attention that's paid to UK copyrights, American copyrights, or Canadian copyrights, or Indian copyrights being now paid to Arabic copyrights. Thank you.